Hello and welcome to the first lecture on the course of the course Design and Pedagogy of the Introductory Programming course. I am Abhiram Ranade of IIT Bombay. Today I am going to give you an overview of the course. Let me begin by observing that the introductory programming course is very important. It is typically the first course in the CS curriculum and programming forms the foundation of computer science. Because it is the first course, it can shape students attitudes towards all of CS. So if they like the first course, if they like programming, then there is greater chance that they will like all of CS. Programming is also important for non-CS majors. This is because many of these students find jobs in IT industry. So it is good if they have a solid foundation in programming. And even if they don't take up an IT job and do their engineering or science jobs, note that these fields use computers heavily. So even for that, it is vital if they have a good knowledge of programming. Finally, a well-known computer scientist, one of the fathers of computer science you might say, uh, Donald Knuth has said that the ultimate test of understanding any topic is whether you can write programs related to that topic. This is because when you write programs, you have to know the topic inside out. You have to know what happens in every case because in your program you will have to consider every case. So you can write programs only if you know the topic very well and in, and in that sense programming is really testing your knowledge. Now computer programming is a fairly unique course in that it allows students to build something. If you look at what students have learned or what they have done until they do the first year course in college, you will see that they have done things like memorizing facts or even understanding facts and solving problems. But they do not they don't produce anything. They might do some projects here and there, but those are small projects and nothing, nothing like a working model or anything that works comes out. Okay. But computer science or computer programming enables them to build games maybe, build things any, so, so a program is almost like a live object and computer programming allows you to create something that interacts with you and that is very thrilling. Now programming can be about anything. It can be about mathematics, it can be about engineering, it can be about commerce, it can even be about art, it can certainly be about games. And it can in, in some sense you can explore the whole world. It can be about biology, Bio, bioinformatics is a big field these days. So you may have likings and programming facilitates your, your, uh, your tastes and your likings. And last but not the least, there is a psychological aspect to all this as well. Throughout childhood, our students have been obedient students or we, would, we like them to be obedient students. What that means is they are accustomed, accustomed to following orders. However, when it comes to computers, they are actually in charge, they are actually commanding, they are in control of the computer. So this change, this psychological change I think can be extremely liberating. So what does all this add up to? It seems to me that there is potential in all of this for students to fall in love with programming. But is that what happens? If you look at the current state, we seem to be having a big crisis. So let's look at the international scenario first. There are studies which indicate and Watson and Lee are the two authors whose study I am going to talk to you about. They have surveyed computer introductory programming courses in 15 countries and 161 such courses and over several languages. 
C, Python, C++, Java, Visual Basic, Fortran and a few others as well. And what did they find? They found that over all countries, over all languages, the failure rate was about 30%. Actually it was more than 30%. So less than 70% of the students who took the course passed it. That's really bad news in my opinion. And this study is not the only one. There was a similar study some time ago with similar findings. It's surprising that the, those numbers were also essentially the same. The Indian scenario, scenario is also similar. So there are several surveys, but perhaps the most well-known survey is from aspiringminds.com. And they say that many graduates cannot write simple programs. In fact, they say that uh, even getting a program to compile is somewhat difficult for, for our Indian graduates. And of course, there are other studies which say that many of our graduates are really unemployable. So things are not really much better over here. Now, if you look at the university failure rates, they are not so easily available. However, University rate, uh, failure rates and difficulty of papers are related. So I think the papers that are uh, produced for exams in India often tend to be based on rote learning, on memorization. And therefore, it is possible that the failure rate is not as high. On the other hand, the capabilities that we are testing for are certainly much lower. So I think we should, be, we should be worried about this situation as much as people outside India as well. So we really need to step back and think about what is going on. The first question that arises perhaps is that, is programming so hard? Is it so hard that 30% uh, of the students have to fail? Well, Mark Gazial is an eminent educationist and here is a quote from his blog. He says, here is a possibility. It, that is programming, is inherently hard. So what he's saying is that look, there is nothing to be done here. This is a difficult subject and if 30% of the people are failing, that is just, just an inherent property of the subject. Now I don't subscribe to this. And I would like it if this is false, but that is what an eminent educationist is saying. So we had better take notice. You could say that uh, if 30 percent of the students are failing, maybe we are going too fast. In fact, in a recent conference, Luxton, and Riley, Luxton Riley said that there is nothing like a hard subject. If something is hard for students, you break it down, you slow it down and you, you slow it down until a fair, until you can produce a fair question paper consistent with what you are teaching and you get reasonable failing rates. Again, that would be so a very strong, very, very game changing decision if we decided to slow down our courses. Furthermore. Slowing down courses is easy to say but not easy to do because when you are talking about programming, there is a certain body of knowledge that you want to impart. It is very difficult to break it down. So we may, we may consider that we should break it down but breaking down will not be completely easy. We could also ask, well, are we teaching in the right manner? or is there a different way to teach programming? Now there are many people who have said that actually if you look carefully at what we do in computer programming classes, we teach very little. Well, we teach the language, but other than that, we don't teach much. I'm going to give you an old quote but there are newer quotes of this kind as well, but this old quote is rather eloquent. And this is due to David Grise, who is another stalwart in the field, who says, 
But what do we really teach? We describe the tools the student has at his disposal, that is the do loop, go to, declarations, etc. Give a few examples and then tell him to write programs. Almost no word on how to begin, how to find ideas, how to structure his thoughts and how to arrive at a well-structured, well-written, readable program. In fact, in this same paper, Grise gives an even more detailed analogy. He says something like, suppose you wanted to teach somebody to make wooden cabinets. Suppose you did the following. Suppose you showed him a few tools, maybe a saw, maybe some glue, maybe whatever tools are needed for making cabinets. And you supplied the raw material. And then you showed a few cabinets. And then you say, look, now you know, you have the tools, you know what is to be done, just go ahead and do it. Christ says that, in fact, this is the standard of computer science education, computer programming education when it comes to programming. We teach the language, but we really don't teach how to write programs. This is strong criticism and I am sure many of us will object. But many of us will also agree that there is more than a grain of truth to this. Are we able to motivate students to study? Now, in this day of social media and cell phones, students are extremely distracted. So, we need to do something to get their attention. There have been some studies and I am going to go over them a little bit more in detail during the course. And they say that graphics and animation seem to motivate students, motivate children. Even children can be motivated to write programs through the use of graphics and animation. So perhaps if we feel that our students are not getting motivated, and when I say our students, I mean college going students, if they are not being motivated, maybe we should try things like this. Last but not the least is the question of are our exams fair? Now, over time, researchers have used tests for measuring programming competency of students, the kind of uh, passing numbers, uh, the number of students who are passing the course is one kind of data, but researchers have also conducted tests by asking students to write programs. And if you look at the earliest such tests, they were hard. And as time, as time went on, the tests that researchers have been using have become easier and easier. And we'll see those tests as well. So this raises the issue. Were our exams fair? some time ago, are they now becoming fair? Even at this point, are they fair? Somebody might say that, look, the tests that we are using are so easy now that they are not really measuring anything. So what is a fair test is a really important question. And I think, I, I would suggest that it is not an easy question to answer because experts seem to be divided. Experts seem to be changing their minds about what is a good test. Okay, so all this leads us to this course. All this says that a course in which we discuss how to teach introductory programming is going to be very useful. So here are the goals of this course. First, we will examine how introductory programming courses have been taught over the years. We will examine what the educational literature says are the difficulties. By this I mean specific aspects. Is a uh, loop difficult? Is recursion difficult? What is difficult? Then we will design the course objectives. We will suggest teaching strategies. We will suggest how to motivate students and we will suggest how to create fair exams. So let me give you a quick overview of the topics in this course. So the first topic is going to be introduction and survey. Here we will first look at the traditional approaches to programming education. By this I mean what 
probably goes on in say 90% of the places in India and also abroad, which is a course using a language like C, C++, Java, something like that, maybe Python. Then I will also talk about the non-traditional approaches and these might be based on functional programming for example. And then I will talk about some experience with these. So what are, what are people saying is difficult, what are they saying is easy and then I will try to extract what are the challenges uh, from all the discussion that we are, that we will have. Then I will go towards presenting an approach which, which I might call our approach and one of the big ideas in this approach is to encourage students to become aware of the manual algorithms that they already know. You might agree with me that our students, that is first year college students, already, already know a lot of algorithms and I contend that by getting them to be aware, it will help us teach them to program. And in fact, what we are going to say is that we should be teaching them how they should translate from what they know about manual computation or they should translate their manual algorithms to computer programs. And this translation is what we should be teaching them. In addition, we will also teach, we will also talk about some generic problem solving strategies which I believe we should be teaching them. In this discussion, the programming language that we will consider for examples is going to be C++. Most of it will be without object oriented programming, but some of it we will discuss to what extent we should use object oriented programming. Many ideas however will be applicable to all languages. So if you are going to use Java, still many of these ideas will be applicable. Then I will talk about pedagogical strategies. What I mean by this is that we already have in mind a certain curriculum that we want to teach which I will discuss in our second main topic that is what I have written down as basic ideas in our approach. Once we have fixed our basic uh, curriculum, we might need to teach things so as to help motivate students or we might have to teach things which help us in teaching them. So we are going to use, we are going to teach students some kind of graphics. So graphics is going to be a teaching aid and it will also serve as a fun element. It will serve as an element which will keep our students attracted. However, you will note, you will be pleased to note that it's not going to be all fun. Graphics is a really, a really powerful medium. It allows us to explain many things very nicely. It can be used to give very challenging project, challenging programs as assignments and also for projects. So we will have fun, but we will have good learning as well. A second idea or a second pedagogical strategy that we are going to be using is a so-called repeat statement. This is not a statement which is already in C++. This is a statement that we have designed and we have so to say inserted into the language through the use of a preprocessor macro. So as far as our students are concerned, it will look like a language statement. It will turn out that the repeat statement is very easy to understand and therefore students can start using repeat within 5 minutes of starting the course because it's so easy. Which means that from the first day our students can start writing in interesting programs. Because repetition is sort of key to anything interesting going on. Otherwise, if it's some kind of straight line code that they have to write, then it cannot be too fun or too interesting or it cannot be too powerful. So with the repeat you will see that we will be able to write quite interesting codes quite interesting programs, programs which do interesting things from the very first day. And we will see when we survey how programming has been taught that simple loops are actually not that straightforward to understand. And what will happen is 
that because of the repeat statement, we will get a foot in the door as far as understanding loops is concerned. And therefore, it will sort of help us actually, or it will help the students in coming to grips with the standard looping statements like while and for and do while. And finally, as far as the pedagogical strategy is concerned, I'm a big believer in motivational examples. If I have to teach something, the motivation has to be extremely clear. If you tell the student something like, look, you will not know, you don't, I can't tell you why you are going to be using this or why this is a useful thing, but believe me, use it. Believe me, learn it. They are not going to feel very motivated to study whatever you are telling them. So as teachers, it's a really important responsibility for us to be finding motivational examples and that is going to be stressed a lot. The fourth topic is we will go and talk about designing medium sized programs. So until, until this point or until say 75% of our course, the programs we, li we write will be maybe 20 line at most, 30 line at most. By medium sized programs, I mean programs which are about 100 lines. So things do change at that point. You have to be a lot more careful. You have to be a little bit more, a little bit more careful in how you spend your effort. So I will talk about standard libraries. I will talk about object oriented programming. Maybe I will talk about dynamic memory allocation. So these are the topics which are needed for designing medium sized programs. But of course, I realize that every course in every university in India may not talk about this because they might say that, look, we only have 25 lectures to devote to introductory programming and they may have a second course. So I will also discuss what parts of the course are going to be compulsory sort of the core elements and what you can consider as the optional elements and which you should do in a second course or which you should do if you have time. And finally, I will talk about designing exams. What types of questions you should ask and how do you estimate the difficulty? What care you should be taking? As far as estimating difficulty is concerned, there is this so-called Bloom's taxonomy, which says, how do you measure? How do you sort of talk about the hardness of a question? Many of the ideas that I have, that I'm, I will be discussing have been discussed in a book I wrote, which is cited at the end and it, they have been tried out in IITB, IIT Bombay. So a few administrative issues, the grading will consist of a weekly assignment and that will contribute to 25% of the final, of your final score. There will be a final examination which will contribute 75%. The reading will come from slides, from the uploaded papers and some material will refer to the book that I mentioned. The name of the book is An Introduction to Computer Programming through C++ and it was published by McGraw-Hill uh, four years ago. Apoorva Garg, who is a research scholar or a PhD student in IIT Bombay is going to be a teaching assistant for this course. And like all NBTEL courses, we will be having a discussion group. So please ask questions. We will attempt to answer them as quickly and in as much detail as possible. So here are the references and you are welcome and you are encouraged to look at the references and find them on the net. If you don't find a reference, I'll be happy to uh, upload it or send it to you. Thank you. That's the end of the first lecture.